and you should be able to present. Okay, should I begin or? Great. Um, so uh, welcome and thanks for, for inviting us. Uh, I'm gonna go through the first part of the presentation. David will finish up with the, uh, the, the second half and then we can get to uh, questions. But I think it, it's important and I've, anyone who follows agricultural markets knows that we have been even prior to uh, the current crisis, um, knows that we've been at very high world prices. Um, you know, that's across the board the, the, at some of the highest levels that we've seen uh, for cereals and other things since really 2000, the late 2012, 13, 14 period. Um, and so uh, prices are up is, is due to a number of factors. We've had a, a, a bad crops in South America. Um, it, I think caught a few people by surprise when it happened, but uh, the soybean crop has deteriorated a lot. And presumably the second crop of, of corn will, or maize will also be affected. Um, we had droughts in the Mideast. We've had droughts across North Africa um, that has affected uh, 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 wheat demand. And then other sorts of things that, that we see, uh, the vegetable oil market in particular has, has, has skyrocketed. Um, that's due to a lot of factors, the soy, uh, soybean oil uh, being affected by the droughts in South America. Uh, palm oil, there was typhoon in uh, Malaysia. We've had, uh, uh, on top of that, we've seen very strong demand uh, out of China. So China has imported a lot of feed grains a lot, and a lot of, um, and, and a lot of wheat and a lot of uh, soybeans this past couple of years. Uh, and soybeans actually longer than that, but uh, again, big market. And then also uh, increased demand for um, vegetable oil for biodiesel production. So the, this whole food versus fuel debate seeps into the current discussion as well. Uh, the US in particular has ramped up uh, uh, soybean oil going into uh, biodiesel production um, and uh, accounting for almost 40% of, of vegetable oil production now in the US or soybean oil production. And then um, in for palm oil, that's been another big factor where we've seen Indonesia uh, with with a thirty percent blending requirement on on diesel. So all of this is, has put extreme pressures on prices. Next slide, David. And so you know, because of this very strong demand, and again because of these supply disruptions, we're now seeing stocks to use ratios, that is, uh, here I'm expressing them in terms of ending uh, days of use of ending stocks, but um, there are, they've been for, for at least a week, uh, maize and soybeans at, at some of the lowest levels since these price spikes that we saw in 2007, eight for wheat and later for uh, corn and soybeans uh, 2012, 13. I think that if there's one good thing in uh, uh, silver lining in all this story is the fact that rice production actually has been strong and, and we've actually seen building of rice stocks at the highest level. Although, um, you know, if you go back to 2007, 2008, uh, rice was a big part of that picture of food price spikes and export restrictions and other things that we saw at the time. Next slide, David. Um, the other big thing is to remember that it's just not uh, agricultural prices, but also energy and fertilizer prices. These are key inputs, obviously, into agricultural production and marketing. Um, next slide. So getting into the, uh, uh, the specifics on, on Russia and Ukraine, they are big players. You know, again, all of us remember back when the former Soviet Union was breaking up, these countries were, were largely net importers of grain but they have now uh, grown um, with uh, both expansion of area and, and in particular uh, uh, growth in yields and productivity as, as agriculture in those, those uh, countries been modernized over the last 25 years, such that they are now very, very large exporters accounting for almost a third of, of uh, uh, wheat traded in the world and um, you know, big players for, for feed grains such as barley, maize, and, uh, and then on the vegetable oil market or the vegetable uh, oil seed side, they also, they both are big, 
uh, producers of, of uh, sunflower seed and in particular uh, sunflower seed oil. And, they, and obviously these all contribute, they're a small part of the overall vegetable oil market, but when, when vegetable oil market is very tight, the loss of that in the, in the case of say Ukraine, um, it could be very, very damaging. In terms of overall calories, you know, it's almost 12% of overall uh, of, of global market and calories um, traded in the world. So again, very, very key markets. Next slide. This is uh, a, a, a tough thing. You might just want to focus on the, the far right hand corners just to say the uh, there are a lot of countries that are directly impacted by, by trade disruptions uh, in terms of, of um, the share of, of, of imports that come for these various commodities from Ukraine, but that's in purple. And right now, because of the ports obviously closed uh, and, and, um, and in some cases damage, it's, it's unclear how fast that will actually come on back online if, um, and again, so much depends on, on how this uh, uh, war proceeds. Next slide, David. Um, so in, another important thing, I mentioned uh, the, my interest in, in intra-seasonal uh, 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 trade patterns that, you know, if you were to, if you look at wheat, about 70% of the wheat has been exported this year. Um, or what, what was anticipated to be exported out of Ukraine. So the good news is, is a lot of that wheat that of the 2021 crop has already shipped. That's largely because it's 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 harvested in the summer and then uh, pretty much shipped into the uh, into the fall. You can see for grains like barley and maize, those patterns are shifted a little bit. So about only about 55 percent of the maize crop. Um, is typically shifted uh, uh, shipped by this time of year, um, and uh, similarly for sunflower, it's most of it gets shipped later in the year. So there's still a lot of 21 uh, crop uh, uh, left in Ukraine in storage. Uh, it's all very much un unclear if any of that is damaged or where it's actually even located. But um, when you're talking about uh, disruption to port facilities and then also the infrastructure, most of that grain and oil seeds are, are, rail, are shipped by rail to port facilities um, and some by barge. And so both, both all of that has been disrupted uh, at least uh, currently. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to turn this over to David, but I think the important thing is is to to realize so um, that was 21 crops. Now talking about moving forward to looking at 2022 20, crops, one of the key uh, factors will be um, one planting time. So most of the wheat is it has already is already in the ground. The wheat in Ukraine is planted in the fall, uh, late summer, early fall. And so that's in the ground. Uh, so the questions about when that gets, if and when that gets harvested and when that actually could move uh, will have a, a big impact on, on global supplies. And then the other key thing, of course, is, is uh, plantings and plantings, not just in, um, in uh, uh, Ukraine, obviously, but, but the, uh, David's gonna talk more globally about the global uh, market. David, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank Joe and, and thank everyone for being here. So now I'm going to talk a bit about the, the fertilizer uh, and why it's relevant because it's going to be uh, what will uh, impact significantly the next harvest and not only in Russia and in Ukraine, but worldwide, because that's where, you know, the contagion in terms of um, uh, food prices and, and food insecurity will occur, not only through the output markets and therefore the disruption that uh, occur on the, the wheat market in particular right now, uh, but also beyond. So uh, fertilizer, just not sure uh, how much you know about fertilizer, but there is three main types of fertilizer, phosphate, potash, that directly link to mining activities and for which um, there is a very uneven distribution of these resources on earth. So you cannot just uh, generate a potash out of, of, of nothing, basically went for nitrogenous fertilizer, ammonia, urea, uh, you can process them either from natural gas or uh, from coal, in particular in China. 
And here you see also the link with the natural gas supply and the natural gas prices that I'm going to, to discuss. So even before the crisis, the price of commodities went up, the price of fertilizer uh, were uh, going up significantly. And we have seen some countries that start to put restriction on their export of fertilizer. And that's uh, something that, of course, we will uh, revisit later about similar behavior in, that can occur for uh, agricultural commodities. But uh, typically, we have seen uh, Russia before the crisis uh, limiting its export of fertilizer or banning in some case, and same thing for China. So there was a scarcity of fertilizer before the crisis, leading to these uh, very high prices. But now we also have to acknowledge that Russia and Belarus on uh, the potash sectors uh, play a very big role in supplying the world in fertilizer. So as you see on, on this map, you see the dependency to a fertilizer, a nitrogen fertilizer import and the potassium fertilizer uh, import on, on the right panel. And that's a concern, of course, for uh, Europe, European farmers. But if you look at potassium, actually, so more than 15% of the world uh, uh, potash that, that come from uh, Belarus and, 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 uh, and Russia. Uh, but some countries in Africa are highly dependent to these sources. And even a country like Brazil bring more than 3 billion of, of dollars of fertilizer from Russia normally every year. So that's where we are going to see this issue and where the issue of sanctions can also impact a uh, country worldwide. When you are in Europe in particular, beyond the fact that you import fertilizer, you also import significant amount of natural gas from Russia, you know, it's about 40%. Um, and the natural gas market is a market that is segmented globally. The only thing you can trade basically across continents significantly is liquefied natural gas, but it's a small share. So when you are in Europe, you depend on your pipeline and you have some coming from North Africa. You have some coming from uh, the East, either Russia or um, uh, more from Central Asia. And what it means, it means that currently we see these big gaps between the price of natural gas in Europe and the price of natural gas in the US. The US natural gas market in the last decade and a bit more now has really been reshaped by all the fracking and things like this. So uh, there is a large supply of natural gas in, in the US, but it cannot be traded uh, quickly to, to Europe. And so that what mean, it means that with this gap in the price of natural gas, the price of producing fertilizer in Europe is basically five times the price of producing fertilizer in the US. So that has also differentiated impact in terms of cost, cost for European farmers, but because Europe also provides a lot of inputs to, for example, Africa, there is a cost for uh, some African countries. Okay, now that we have given you the, the picture on, on global market, I'm going to zoom a bit on, uh, on the Ukraine situation. Of course, things are, are, are very fluid there. Um, a part of the uh, eastern uh, region of, of Ukraine uh, are also very um, hot spot in terms of production from Ukraine, but not for all the crops. So here you see that for barley on the upper left corner, significant share of the production is most on the western part of the country or southwest part of the country. For sunflower, it's a bit balanced, but if you look at uh, the, the Donbass region, it's a small part, but of course, if unfortunately Ukraine uh, is losing control of uh, what's happened to the east side of the Dnieper, uh, that will be more important. But if you now look at both wheat and corn, uh, you see that both the northeast is very important for corn, and actually the, the, the southeast is very important for wheat. So uh, all the regions that are between Crimea and the uh, eastern provinces are actually also a very important uh, part of uh, Ukraine agricultural production. So that's where, on one hand, if military operation continue, we can see a disruption in farm operation. But if now we also have this region that are 
either annexed by Russia or under um, an occupied Ukraine that will be also victim from sanctions, it means that this uh, this part of the production may not reach uh, global markets or at least in a very different manner. Um, in terms of calendar, so as Joe have said, what is traded right now, it's the harvest from last year. In the field, you have also the wheat that have been planted during the winter and will be harvested in, uh, in July. So for the wheat, the next big uh, event is the harvest in July. And then the question is, can it be harvested? Uh, so can farmers access the field? Do they have their tractors and fuel to do the operation? Then I will say a few words about logistics. But also next month, we'll start the planting of barley, um, of uh, corn and sunflowers. So that way also the, the, the clock is ticking uh, for this um, uh, new uh, crops. As I was saying, you know, uh, that's what the production location, you also have to think that these have to uh, actually reach the, the, the world market or the, at least the regional market. And so you have a number of uh, ports that are actually strategic uh, for Ukraine. The bulk of it is around the region of Odessa, but you also have uh, some entry point on the Azov Sea um, around uh, Mikotlev. And uh, currently, all of these actually lines are totally disrupted, meaning that, and since um, early February, uh, the Russians were conducting military exercise around Crimea that were already um, putting a kind of light blockade on, on the port of Odessa, on the operation, and now it's just a total disconnection. And if the, the Russian troops go up to Odessa on the west, and since they have connected basically now with the, the eastern provinces, it means that Ukraine may lose all access to, uh, to sea. Um, in the coming uh, weeks, and so that we totally reshape all the, the production can reach the, the markets. Um, the war also is destroying, uh, as you know, infrastructure, and 80% of the grain in Ukraine use the uh, railroads, and all the rail infrastructure are already pretty weak even before this crisis. Uh, there were a lot of disruption, um, and, and so uh, you know, even if military operations stop, but inf infrastructure has been destroyed, uh, even if farmers can access their field, it still means that we can see a significant problem in terms of uh, moving grain uh, around. So future implication, and we are uh, nearly done, don't worry. Um, of course, there is right now a short-term crisis for key food importers, in particular in the MENA region, that every week uh, still bring uh, wheat from uh, this part of, of the world. Uh, of course, we have some level of inventories and stocks at home. So it's not because Egypt cannot buy uh, this week uh, some wheat that people in Egypt are going to not have bread on the table. Depending on where you are, it can be one month, two more, three months of, of, of things. Um, but it's still already an issue today with higher prices. Uh, mainly faced by the government because in this part of the world there's a lot of public procurement of, of wheat and government have policy that disconnect the price of wheat from the price of flour and the price of bread for managing uh, political stability I will say but that's that's a concern just put it something on the, the right side on Egypt then we also have to think that beyond countries you have WFP that operate in the region with currently hotspot in terms of famine uh, if you think about Yemen, uh, but if you think about also the Horn of Africa, and they are traditionally sourcing part of their supply from the Black Sea. In cases, it's grain, it's sunflower oil, or it's just flour. But here for the uh, WFP, there is a kind of uh, double-edged sword that they face because clearly there is disruption in quantity and some ships cannot leave uh, the, the Black Sea or cannot resupply. But also the overall in price increase is actually reducing drastically the purchasing power of WFP and their budget is right now totally uh, eroded by this price increase. I think that during the week 
They managed to get 1.6 billion additional for their operation, but still pretty well. Medium term, uh, what's happened on the fertilizer market here is very important because we are going to see two effects. Once again, for farmers that can afford this fertilizer, it increased their cost of production and therefore will increase also their selling price or their output. But in some places, you are going to have farmers that will not be able to purchase or to uh, have access to fertilizer. So their productivity is going down. And so the world supply on several uh, commodities will go down. And for countries also that spend money on subsidizing fertilizer, right now there is a huge fiscal cost to, to pay in a context where the COVID-19 has already generated a number of costs for these countries. And it's not like if they are all staying on a pile of money ready to deal with the next crisis. Um, now, uh, more longer term, we also have to uh, think about what can mean uh, for the world market where Russia can be, in some case, ostracized, uh, but at the same time may create its own cartel on, on, on wheat and on some other grains because they are already the first producer on wheat. If you now had the, the shares from uh, Ukraine, as you have seen in the slide presented by uh, by Joe, we are talking about adding 15 or 30 percent, uh, reaching 15 to 30 percent on several commodities, up to 80 for sunflower oil. But we know that earlier this year also, uh, Russia has done uh, military support to Kazakhstan. That is another big wheat producer. So we can really start to have a new um, organization around uh, food as a geostrategic uh, uh, component. Uh, and with climate change, that can even be worse because actually Russia can be one of the countries that can benefit from climate change based on this location and the ability to move north some of its uh, production. Uh, when, if you are a small country, you cannot really adjust to, to climate change, Russia can. So uh, on some of the work we did with, with some colleagues, we have seen that actually the, the market share of Russia on wheat can, can increase, like Canada, when Australia is hammered by climate change and become a, a lower producer, for instance. So you have also this more longer uh, perspective on, on that. So policy response, and I will conclude with, with, with that. Obviously, in advanced economies, uh, there is a capacity to, to, to mobilize resources uh, to protect uh, farmers and consumers. The key question will be how the sanctions are going to be uh, implemented and uh, even with the, the, the sadness of the situation and the need to, to, to use all the economic means to put pressure on, on some countries. Um, making sure that the food can circulate and that inputs are, are, are delivered uh, is something pretty important. So sanctions should try to um, avoid uh, bashing these the sectors. Even if even before this crisis, due to what has happened last year with the, uh, for example, the Ryanair hijack uh, by uh, the, the Belarus authorities and the crackdown on their own population, Belarus was targeted by sanction already and the sanctions should have applied to their big uh, state and parastatal company that is trading um, potash. So you know that uh, we, we have these things ongoing and, and things can get worse. Uh, obviously, WFP is going to need more resources and also their shipment typically should be uh, excluded from sanctions. So clearly a moratorium for humanitarian, uh, for, I mean, you don't want sanction on humanitarian activities. Um, the issue of, of uh, fiscal resources for government in the global south to support their farmer and to support their consumer is going to be a, a major uh, issue. In, typically in Europe, in the US, but also in Indonesia and in other places of the world, we still use today uh, vegetable oil and uh, grains to produce biofuel. That, is not the smartest idea that people can have and currently can put additional pressure on markets. And we just raise this point because we are going to hear that, oh, you need, you know, uh, energy independency towards Russia. So we need, we need biofuel. Uh, but sometimes it's a very fallacious argument in the sense that if you still import inputs or if you use scarce inputs to produce food that you are going to spend, sorry, crops that you are going to burn in your cars, uh, actually, you are no more, you know, you're just creating a dependency on another markets and your overall security has not been improved. 
um, but also uh, your energy management is has to go beyond biofuel, you know, reducing even the carbon footprint of the transportation sectors go. Uh, in many cases, uh, it's not really dependent on what you do on biofuel, actually. And uh, last but not least, uh, first, this list is not uh, holistic. During the discussion, we can also discuss about other policy avenue. Um, but there is uh, how we manage nutrients, I mean, from the soil perspective. And therefore, all the debate on sustainability um, can also be reframed in terms of national security. You know, how we rely on external sources uh, for uh, some uh, nutrients where actually world markets cannot really be diversified because I think our overall also a narrative is not to say that world markets are, are bad. Actually, they are pretty good. Uh, it's just the fact that in some specific sectors, you have this high level of concentration. That's true done by countries. And actually, in some cases, that's true by companies. And in order to get markets to operate properly, you need more diversification. So the question is not clearly to have everyone in autarky. That will be worse, for example. Today, Morocco, Morocco, they face on one hand uh, the problem potentially of buying wheat, but at home they have a major drought. So even a self-sufficient Morocco will be not something doable at all. The question is more how we manage market with first uh, open market, transparent system, inclusive market, and how we can get more countries participating to world trade and not less. Um, that's all for, for now. Uh, before the uh, opening and, and uh, I would say in terms of research, now, if you think about what type of research we do, here you see it's more um, presenting, presenting facts, articulating things based on the different data set we have access, and, and the, the logic of the model, kind of intellectual theory about how, how the world operates. Um, but we also use various economic models, that is free, and things like that. What we just have to be clear is some of the models we use have never been designed to deal with crisis, meaning that when markets stop to operate, when actually ships cannot move, you know, in some cases, if you have a blockade, the price are not going to clear a market. So that's where we, what we try to say in particular with, with donors and with government is, depending on the resource question, in some cases you need sophisticated modeling, in some cases you don't want it. And the time horizon of the resource question also should dictate the type of tools. If you are basically thinking about the 90 days time horizon, Supply is not going to adjust. So basically, it's where we are going to potentially reallocate existing harvest, existing supply. If now you have a 12-month time horizon, that's where people are going to take decisions. Farmers are going to put in land more spring wheat or less. So that's the type of model. And if now you think about what it means for the next 10 years or 15 years, here, obviously, a lot of models that we have can, can really tell a story. But as of today, I will say, all the scenario can be too speculative to start to engage in a big research you know, initiative. Uh, because depending on how the situation is going to stop in Ukraine in two weeks, three weeks from now, the organization of the world can be really uh, reshaped. And that's the type of long-term scenario that are interesting to, to study with uh, AV machinery in terms of, of modeling. Um, but, uh, but yes, I mean, research agenda should, should really uh, be fine-tuned. Um, and that is free because we really work with uh, policy makers and, and current decisions that try to, to adjust. Thanks a lot. Thank you both. Thank you, David. Thank you, Joseph. Um, it's really interesting to see the, the, the overall um, analysis. And I have a very quick question, technical. I don't know if you want to know the answer before we open up, actually. If we stopped, given that there is a possibility of um, um, disruption. If if production stopped using uh, fertilizers, what would be the percentage lost of crops? Could could we afford that? I, mean, I don't know the the numbers. So you know, is it realistic? Could we do that? So I mean, here it's it's going to vary uh, um, a lot, um, and in some cases in a bit of counterintuitive way, meaning that if you are in Europe. Actually, we, on several of these fertilizers, we have more or less reached a plateau in terms of what we can do in terms of additional production. So we can 
uh, basically your yield relation with mini fertilizer at one point become a logistic kind of function. And so, you know, you have a plateau. So for this advanced economy, they can afford to, um, to reduce a bit their fertilizer consumption without to see major yield decline. But what's going to happen in, in reality is that in many cases, the farmers in this advanced economy have the money to pay for this fertilizer or are not going to be too worried. So that may not be the first one to cut their fertilizer consumption. At the opposite, if you're in Africa, you, not, you, you basically don't use enough fertilizer. And in many cases, if you look at the relation uh, between fertilizer and, and productivity, it's a still a straight line with sometimes a pretty steep slope. So any loss of fertilizer for them can lead to, uh, to, to some uh, production loss. And for some crops is 30% less fertilizer. It can mean 30% less or more of production. So that's and, and in some of these countries that where basically people doesn't have the capacity to compete on the price of fertilizer and they will have to make the sacrifice. Now, um, I'm an economist. I'm not an agronomist, so at one point, my, my knowledge also stop. We have to acknowledge that depending on the type of crops you have, depending on the type of soil you have, uh, here you have some um, uh, flexibility. In some case also, for the next harvest, it cannot be too bad, but you are going to uh, still reduce the nutrient in your soil, so you are degrading your soil. Um, and if the situation repeat over two cycles, that can be a problem. So that's the story. Now, in terms of number, uh, I have seen things going from 5% less production globally to 30%, depending on how people think the situation will be. Um, uh, maybe, uh, and just to say that, if we, we don't do outlook projection per se, but what will be the next harvest, there's a lot of other people doing it uh, globally. And I think that right now everyone is a bit cautious. Everyone thinks about what to do. Um, and maybe Joe can say a, a word about that. Um, now, can we afford a reduction in production overall? My answer will be more or less no, in the sense that, as Joe has said, we have very low level of inventory to start with. So it's not like if we, you know, we, we have a lot of buffer. Uh, still, the rice market is pretty doing uh, good. So that's uh, the kind of good news there. But I let my uh, Joe uh, add on on this. Yeah, and, and very briefly, I think David covered most of what I would say on in terms of fertilizer use. I do think that even in, in the US and in the developed countries, at least, we do tend to over fertilize a bit, even though the, the efficiency on that is, has improved over the last 10, 15 years. I think uh, certainly in the States, it has a bit. But, but I, I still think there's a lot of over uh, fertilization. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how that, that actually has an impact on, on uh, production. I agree with, uh, I mean, I, I do think that the major forecasting, institutional forecasters like FAO, OECD, when they're doing their outlook, uh, um, preparing their outlook and, and USDA um, uh, will put out their first look in May. Uh, they had an outlook conference last week and I think that it was right on the, the, uh, uh, the poor guy, the poor chief economist had to give a speech the, the morning after the invasion started. So with all the numbers that were prepared long before that. So uh, they will be assessing that. And I think they will be very, very cautious in mm -hmm. terms of how they proceed. But, but the real, I think the real worry is gonna be in developing countries and poor developing countries that, that as David says, it, it's, it will be both um, an access issue and then also uh, um, um, uh, uh, and then in particular a price issue. The only, the only thing I would add is that if you look at Ukraine in terms of their uh, production, uh, annual production, you know, the loss of, of Ukraine to the market is about akin to what we saw in 2007, eight with the droughts in Australia and other shortfalls at the time. So a big, it's akin to a very large drought. The only thing I would say is that it's on top of already very low stocks as opposed to 2007, eight, where we came into that, that campaign with a, a, a little better uh, uh, position globally in terms of stocks. So it's very tight. And so, you know, people are gonna be watching mm -hmm. every weather yeah. disturbance in the world. 
you know, because of the pandemic, you mean, Joseph? You had already. That's what you meant to the disruption. Well, it's it's less the pandemic is the fact that you had uh, this drought in South America. You had mm -hmm. a strong demand out of Asia. You had a drought in North America last year mm -hmm. in the Northern Plains. So the wheat crop out of Canada and the Northern Plains of the U.S. was affected too. So there's been a, a, mm -hmm. a draw a drawdown in stocks due to a number of factors. But that's where we are, and so. Yes. It, a lot of volatility. Yeah, um, I, I have more questions, but I want to open up the discussion to others. Uh, please, um, if you have any questions or comments, uh, open your mic or write write them down if you want. If you prefer. Just a quick question. Just yeah, a quick please. question. Uh, well, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Daniel and Joseph, for a, a great presentation. Just wondering. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm Jack Sry. Um, co-chair of the Global Food Security Initiative and, and main focus in, in engineering is on supply chains. Have you sort of looked at the population movements? So uh, the fact that there's going to be quite a significant population movement out of Ukraine will mean there's, as well as uh, disruption to uh, transport links, there's, there's this loss of labor um, to actually uh, support the sector but also a shift in demand as population moves out um, so you see a number of impacts both on the supply side and the demand side um, do, do you look at that in a sort of conflict uh, situation um, i'm also also the second question i had was i presume the exports from ukraine may well have been uh, to neighboring countries is you know, so the, is is that largely true for uh, these commodities? Well, let me ask uh, answer the second part of the question first, and then David can uh, uh, may want to deal with the first part or add to the, to, to what I say. But it, it, in terms of the flows, you're you're right. A lot of I mean, really, Ukraine is ships globally, so so it depends on the commodity. But if you look at wheat, a lot of that wheat goes to the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, but some ends up in places like uh, Indonesia and um, uh, you know uh, Bangladesh. Um, so you know there, there, there's a, a if you look at the feed grains for the most part that goes to Europe is is moves by rail to Europe. So uh, you know in, in normal times uh, that would be less affected. It's unclear what's going on now. Uh, but uh, sunflower seeds, that too would mainly go out the ports, I think, and, and largely go to, um, you know, again, markets all over the Mideast and North Africa, where you're, you're right, they, have a, they, they will have some competitive advantage there shipping some of those commodities because of the location, and they compete with Russia in a lot of those markets already. Um, but, it, but, you know, that, that's where the demand is too for, for commodities like wheat, so. David, you may want to. I mean, we we touched on the refugee issue a little bit, but uh, uh, David, you may want to hit some of the macro uh, questions. Yeah. Yes, and um, and just to to say that we we talk, of course, a lot about wheat, but as Doa said, sunflower, sunflower seeds, sunflower oil is pretty important, and actually, sunflower oil also go up to 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 India and in South Asia. And right now, there is a lot of issues on the vegetable oil market overall uh, also, and that's a concern, I think, for, for, for South Asia as a whole. The second point also is, in the recent years, uh, Ukraine has made a lot of improvement in the quality of their grains and wheat. So, for instance, sometimes they were considered as a better uh, sourcing than, than Russia. So, yes, um, uh, Indonesia was preferring to, to bring uh, Ukrainian wheat than Russian wheat. And until the Olympic Games, basically, even China was not eager to, to import uh, Russian wheat and had some SPS uh, limitation that they, um, they have left and to some extent that create a new uh, uh, market for, for, for Russia. Now, on the, the, your on, on the impact of conflict, I think that, yes, you are totally right. Um, there is a typology of, of conflict and how they impact food security, both by moving population and the demand by moving uh, uh, labor and, and the supply in some case by destroying the logistic in some case by destroying the, the processing 
So we'll not enter in detail here, but just to, to summarize what's happened in Ukraine. So yes, we have refugee moving west, um, but we are bringing refugee in a part of the world that start with no food security problem. I mean, that you can bring even 10 people, 10 million people more in Europe. Uh, Poland is not going to starve to take care of the refugees. So there is this absorption capacity in Europe uh, to, to manage this. Now, the last share of the population that is displaced are um, people from urban centers. So that's not really the farmer that today is leaving the field. And in Ukraine, we talk about a modernized agricultural system where mechanization is pretty high. So it's not like if when we are, let's say, in Central Africa or in DRC, where if you don't have a lot of workers in your field, you cannot harvest. Here, that's going to be more about making sure that the few uh, farmers that, and in many cases, farmers doesn't want to leave their land, so they may be the last guy to, 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 to leave. But do we have tractors? Do we have fuel? That can be more, you know, this type of constraint, more than the labor constraints per se. Where we see labor constraints and already big disruption is going, for example, for the sunflower oil processing. Because here it's an industry. In, and you need people and you need infrastructure and that's where we can create this bottleneck so you know people will harvest sunflower they will have sunflower seed but no one to process it so that can create the, this uh, this aspect um, but so th that's a kind of summary in terms of, of logistic and, and things like this uh, we are not dealing with an agriculture that is very labor intensive so that's where the, this part of the problem may be relatively uh, simple. Now, um, I mean, yeah. In any case, we are going to have food security uh, uh, because we have conflict in Ukraine. You are going to have people that may starve in Ukrainian city if they are seed. So they you know this very hot spot of food uh, insecurity. And um, last but not least, um, I was looking at this yesterday. Uh, pretty sure also that you are going to see food security problem even in Russia, uh, not due to the fact that wheat is going to disappear, but just, you know, the major economic crisis like the Russian economy is going through has always severe impact on nutrition and food security of the population. So, yes, for various reasons, hunger and malnutrition will go up even in uh, Europe this, this year. If I can sneak in a bit, one quick question, Francesco, was sure, go ahead. price elasticity uh, in terms of supply. So, uh, as prices rise, more people, more farmers, more producers enter the market because it's more lucrative to do so. I would yeah, say, so, go ahead, so, David. So, so, uh, I will let, uh, so talk more. But I would say yes and no because what's really very important for farmers is their profit margin. And right now, the cost of uh, input also is pretty high. So, you know, who we, we, it's like if it is hyper profitable to make crops. Some crops are profitable, but some, if you look at your uh, current cost of production, um, they, 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 they are still not looking so, so, so great. Um, and, and then the question is your time horizon. I mean, on the long run, we have seen always pretty nice response of the supply. Uh, now for six months, that, that's a bit more close. But Joe can talk, uh, of course, more about that. Yeah, I, I, you know, the interesting thing would be, so where, where would that supply response come? Um, you know, the, the debate here in the U.S. has been we have, you know, 20 million acres, you know, some 8 million hectare or whatever in, in long-term set-aside uh, that's put in there for conservation purposes. Um, and so there's been a little debate that's going on over the last couple of days. Is should you just release farmers and say, you can plan any of that and bring that into production. But in fact, the, the, the window is pretty short right now uh, for a spring planted crop. So uh, certainly it would be very, very difficult to get a wheat crop in. And even on top of that, a lot of that land is already in very marginal uh, quality. It's, it, it was put into those conservation reserve program for a reason. Those are poor, uh, poor yielding areas. It's areas where, you know, you might have planted a, a wheat 
with a one to two year followed by one a two year follow or whatever. So it's not great quality. And and I think that um, experience showed in back in the height of the price crisis in 2007, eight, et cetera, that when when it was allowed for some of that land to come out, it just didn't come out. The farmers thought, well, that's one year. It's poor quality land. I just soon keep this land in in conservation, um, uh, uh, accruing conservation benefits. On top of that, of course, by by going into fallow land and or land that's been a long term set aside and plowing it up uh, to put in a crop or sowing seeds, you release a lot of nitrous oxide, and and so these big spikes in greenhouse gases that you know have been part of the reason people have touted these long term uh, set asides really speak to the issue of, you know, this climate debate of people saying, hey, you, you, we, we could use agriculture, you know, agriculture could be a big source of carbon uh, reduction if we wanted to. So I think it's, it's a very complicated debate, but I think the reality is it doesn't really matter that, that a lot of the, as David said, the input costs are very high. I don't think you're gonna bring land in to pay those sorts of prices. And if you look at the, the Western half of the US, it's been under a, a severe drought over the last year, where a lot of that land is located. So it's a lot of the land in the US is in the north, is in the plains, particularly in the northern plains. That has been dry. I just was looking at the map yesterday that's put out by the Weather Service, and they're calling for another 30 days of drought conditions, uh, sustained drought conditions in those areas. So I, again, I don't, long term, that may be a way. Uh, where I would expect, you know, un and unfortunately for the climate side of things is, you know, deforestation and bringing, converting pasture land into farmland in South America and, and other places like that. Thanks. I, I think Thank I was you, thinking more, more along, along the lines of, you know, uh, switching into commodity products. Um, we, we've, we've just been doing a, a large project, Tigress, looking at uh, sustainable food systems uh, in India, uh, where a lot of the farmers don't really make a sustainable living uh, producing wheat, um, for example. Um, but but I, you know, great, great, great set of issues. I mean, this nexus between yeah. even cotton and wheat yeah, is, exactly. a, is another one uh, where, you know, do, do you um, focus on food products or and or, cotton uh, prices are at record high levels as well, which is, yeah. you know, that's yeah. complicating things. I so see, very which, interesting trade-off. Um, yeah, we were on a phone call yesterday with uh, our colleagues in, in Egypt, and they were talking about Turkey and just saying the same thing, that cotton yeah. producers there just weren't, weren't willing to plant anything else. I mean, that they were at, at the price. They haven't seen prices this high in a few years, so they're going to take advantage of it. Yeah. Any more? Okay. Questions or comments before I, I also jump in with the, with a further comment, please. I'm sure can there I, are more. Can I just ask one please, quick Milorad. question, please? Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, David uh, Milorad Vedakovic. I'm a vet here at the Department of Veterinary Medicine teaching veterinary public health. And my question would be more uh, following this terrible situation and in Ukraine at the moment and the war and impact on food. Has anyone been predicting what would be impact on animal feed uh, prices and, and supply and, and the consequences and, and who really depends in the world more from the current geographical Ukrainian and Russian kind of uh, production of feed too that's my question basically thank you yeah no I, I'll, I'll let me just start real quick and david can take over but uh, it, as we said a lot of the corn and, and barley that's uh, produced in uh, or it, certainly a lot of the corn is produced in the ukraine goes to the eu for for feeding purposes for animal feed so that is really key uh, i guess i would have to look at trace the barley uh, a little more closely to see how much of that, but the feed market has already been been stressed. And um, I know, again, I here I'm going to speak more from just the U.S. Uh, uh, situation since I know that that animal sector uh, much better. Is that you know we've we've seen uh, a beef cycle that's been in a downturn. Um, the the talk is at least what I've seen from hog producers and others saying that they they may. Uh, reduce herds, uh, some of the herds. So it could have 
uh, I think, big impacts on on animal production uh, globally. David? Yes, no, you, 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 that, that, that's true. I think for Europe in particular, the corn that is, is imported from, from Ukraine is using for feed. The good news on feed is normally you have a bit more flexibility to switch from one crop to another yeah. or from one. So you have the sorghum, you have the barley. So depending on which uh, animal you talk about, of course, things are a bit more uh, things. When for wheat, uh, for human consumption, if you are in, in Egypt or uh, in Sudan, you are not going to start to do a multi cereal bread to tomorrow. So that, that's where the wheat market has this specificity. Um, still, I think that if you look at the price of soybean today, uh, it's obvious that um, you are not, they are very high. That's not when Russia and Ukraine are, are not uh, producing soybean in a significant manner. So it means that people are already doing uh, arbitrage, trade off. But yeah, I, I mean, the, the opportunity to switch from one feed to another is going to, to be limited. Now, um, for some producers, uh, and, and that's going to be a minor point, but still also, actually, Russia was importing a number of animal products, like pork, like things like this. So there are some markets that are also going to disappear. So some of the European producer or even US producers are not going to worry about this market anymore. Um, but yeah, and I think in the last 18 months, also the feed market has been under tremendous pressure uh, by the demand coming from China and the recovery of the, the, the Chinese inventory on, on pigs and hogs coming from the, the African swine flu thing. So this maybe is a bit, um, so that's all I can say, but yeah, this interconnectivity between crops is very important. You know, the domino effect uh, is going to be uh, also quite, uh, quite important. So that's all I can say, sorry. Thank you, David, thank you. Um... Any more questions and comments before we wrap up and uh, and thank David and Joseph? It's uh, nearly three, unfortunately. Any more comments or questions? No. You know, a, a very final comment for me. I mean, obviously, these the situations, as uh, everyone is also mentioning already, it sh shows us how much we really need to push more towards investing in alternative resources, in, 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 in forgotten crops, um, in, in e, e, real eco-friendly uh, alternatives in producing. And I know and we talk a lot about this. And, and again, the war today shows us the reality. But I, I hope that we can make these changes quickly enough. I'm, I, I'm not sure. But we're here as academics. Ooh at least all of you to hopefully um, drive that, put, that, that that change. It would be interesting to calculate how quickly that change can uh, happen. But thank you so much, David and uh, Joseph, especially having been invited at such a last uh, last notice. And uh, and I hope that we can, you know, open these discussions another time and um, create some sort of uh, connections unless there's some there's a burning question or comment before we um we close yes enjoy this <laughs> thank you jack for your comment um anyone else before we close no okay wonderful thank you joe thank you david great david. thanks and, so much uh, have a good weekend bye everyone you too see you bye bye Hello. Hello. Are you going Hello. to stop recording? Yes. <laughs> stop recording. Yes.